Hello, everybody. Um, well, I hope it's a cool talk. Um, I shall try my best. So, um, the inspiration behind Cool Zone. It's always, I think, nice if you actually understand why a company started out. And the inspiration behind our company was that um, at the age of two, our um, son uh, contracted type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is um, very different to type 2. You're absolutely completely and in, in, um, dependent upon insulin um, to live your life. So suddenly I was thrown into this world of trying to understand how much insulin to give him um, and when. And that required you to understand what their blood sugars were. And the, and the very reputable hospital, one of the best hospitals in the UK, was saying, what you need to do is take four measurements a day, four blood, pr uh, blood, pricks, um, blood, blood tests a day, and then work out what to do from that. But being a bit of an engineer, being a bit of a scientist, I'm thinking, no, I want to know more. So I started to have to take lots and lots of measurements and realize that there was a pattern that you were looking for, and the pattern was very changeable from day to day. Insulin's good, but too much insulin is bad, and too little insulin is bad. And far too much insulin or far too little insulin is actually health crit a, 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 a critical condition that can, can, can um, put them into hospital or worse. So I went to the hospital and I said, I really would like to have something that can really constantly monitor my son with. I'm sure there must be something. And the best they had was some kind of data log or a huge box you put on where you then monitor for two days and then you found out later, retrospectively, that actually you got it completely wrong. So, um, and they said, you don't need it, you don't need it, just four finger pricks a day. So I went out and I found a company um, who now are a big company called Dexcom, who were very early in their product of developing a real-time constant monitor for monitoring blood sugars. And I was a, one of the first adopters in the UK, and I worked with them to help to perfect the sort of uh, how you manage alarming. Alarming can be so annoying if you get it wrong. So I was helping them to, to perfect how, as a user, you wanted the system to be to, in order to provide what you want, but to not be too intrusive in your life. So you can live your life and optimize it without being weighed down with the responsibility of doing this. So um, they came over and filmed us and filmed for, used it as collateral for their business, filmed our story of how we did things. The other problem was then I needed to give insulin. Once I knew what I needed to do, I then needed to go and get the insulin and do it. And that was another problem. With other kids in the house, sometimes you'd find they'd move things around in the fridge, put the insulin towards the back, it frozen on the back plane of the fridge, on the back plate of the fridge. We went away on holiday, came back, short on insulin surprise, all of the 13 amp ring mains had gone, all the food, the insulin was ruined in the fridge. So then I thought, well, this is no good need now to actually... And another thing I did, I went away on holiday with my insulin supplies, and I opened what I thought was a fridge drawer, shut it, and actually it turned out to be a freezer drawer. Insulin is no good. It completely is completely ruined if you freeze it. So I started, um, we started looking at what we could do to actually control fridge temperatures, not just for medicines and insulin, but for food as well. What we wanted to do in setting out was create something, and this is before Laura, we wanted something that was absolutely reliable and accurate, real time, didn't want to have to teach people how to use it, wanted it to scale, because whilst we were using, initially, initial use was the use case of a domestic, we didn't want to start, uh, to start with that or even end with that. So we wanted something that was completely scalable and we wanted it to be low, and low cost of entry so everyone could adopt it and easy to put in. And our early systems, which are not LoRa, which were 868, sub gigahertz, um, Wi-Fi based in terms of communication to the network, we pan-built these things to try and get out there and get involved with customers rather than build anything in an ivory tower. We wanted to get out there and work with them to find out whether what we thought they needed was really what they needed. Too many people sort of think that they're, getting, they're going down the right path, and when they come out, they've either missed the boat because they're too late, or they've actually missed the target completely. We're working in a very, what we learned when we went out there, and whilst we said we wanted to be plug and play and kind of installable by customers, in the initial days, we went through everything, did the whole process ourselves, because we wanted to be out there and see what it was like doing it. So we were out there crawling around in cold rooms, in fridges, in busy kitchens, and realizing it was a really quite a difficult environment. The batteries don't like cold. They really, they, 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 um, they just can't generate enough power when they go into a cold environment. So you could put a unit into a minus 33 and suddenly it would stop transmitting. 
it, they were driven by legislation. So it wasn't a case of, okay, it's okay if it works sometimes and not others. They get audited on a regular basis with an environmental health officers coming out. And one of the key things about safety is temp how, the, how the goods are being stored, how the food is being stored, how the medicine is being stored. They're difficult locations. A lot of these places are in old buildings. Um, there are many floors. They put some of their storage units down deep underneath the ground because if you're talking about some of the cities, they haven't got much room and they put all their refrigeration units maybe way below where you haven't got Wi-Fi, you haven't got local air networks, you haven't got cellular. So when we suddenly found out about Laura, we thought, whoa, that's fantastic. Because one of the other problems was because the range of the old technology was so poor, if you've got some fridges, you're probably out, out of a fridge, because we put the units inside the fridges. People didn't want to break the seals. They didn't want to have wires everywhere. So the, the, the sensors went inside the fridges, and you can often only get, you could only maybe get 10 meters. That means that in these large organizations, you have to put repeaters in, you have to put more gateways. And there aren't, there aren't the plugs, there just aren't the facilities for that. And if they are, they pull them out to put in a, a food mixer or pull them out to put in a, a hoover or whatever in the night when the cleaners are there. So again, you wanted to take the gateways away from the action and be able to put them somewhere where they weren't going to be touched. And Laura gave us that opportunity. But the trouble was, they were young products. And we were experiencing erratic behavior. We really did not get that plug and play that Laura promises at the beginning. Things were fairly poorly documented, and there was inconsistencies in some of the things that we really would be really beneficial aspects of Laura. There were inconsistencies about how people were implementing things. So as I said, we couldn't assume plug and play. We had to test. We did an awful lot of testing. As a young company, what you want to get out there is be out there, out there selling, out there engaging with your customers, out there getting revenue in. But we were actually forced to do an awful lot of testing and an awful lot of working with our suppliers to say, hey, this isn't right. And a lot, a lot of time they go, hey, it's not us. It's not our part of the stack that's not working, when in fact, it may have been. We had to prove that. Downlinks, the key to reliability. If you can't get downlinks, which we really couldn't in the early days, then you end up with everything on, if you put on an ADR, you end up everything on spread factor 12, which makes the problem worse. If you have a gateway down and you have suddenly have a whole load of sensors trying to rejoin, then you end up with some kind of network storm that can bring the gateway down. And we had a huge problem with downlinks. And given that we were wanting 100% reliability, we wanted to turn on things like confirm message. We wanted ADR so that if it suddenly wasn't transmitting, then it would up its spread factor. We wanted all those features, otherwise Laura, Laura was not going to be the answer for us. We, as I said, we went out and did everything in the field ourselves in the beginning, and there were problems. We had field failures, we had sensors that would suddenly have sudden battery drain, we'd have sensors that just failed, we didn't even know why. Um, we'd have problems with dear old TTN. We, had, we were on the public network, and then we moved across to the private network. We did a migration. We were one of the early customers for them in using their, their um, private networks. And there were problems there. Um, we had um, problems about installing, provisioning. There's a lot of, been a lot of talk about provisioning. It's fine trying to sell a low-cost system to people, but if you, it then takes you hours to provision the goods and then hours to install, then you, can't, you just can't make a viable business. You can't maintain your profit levels when you're trying to sell at low cost. So we did an awful lot of work about working out how to streamline the business so that we could provision these products really quickly and then install them quickly. And installation inside fridges, cold rooms, chest freezers, laboratory fr uh, fridges and freezers and so on, it's really hard. It's really hard to put something in there that will stay there and, st and be, but be removable so that they can swill it all around with water and clean it and clean the, unit, clean the scents themselves, clean inside the fridges. And customers can be such a pain because we put the sensors in there and then they'd ring you up and they'd say, but it's not reading right. It's reading 24 degrees and it's a freezer and it's reading plus 24 degrees. So you have to go out because you're trying to, you're trying to learn from experience you go out there. They've taken it out, they've left it out, the cleaners found it, they've put it in a storeroom and then, uh, now they're measuring the temperature of the storeroom. Or all of our sensors have gone down. So you go out and you found that somebody has decided that this little box that they've got that's plugged in one of the cleaners has thought, oh, that might be useful in my house, and they steal it. So there's no sensors working because the gateway's been stolen. 
So all of these things make it difficult, and a site visit is the dreaded thing that you actually, once you start to really commercialize this product, that's what you've got to avoid. So that means you've not only got to create a great product that customers like, but you've then got to be able to maintain these things and know what's going on, be able to monitor your own monitoring system, be able to diagnose your own monitoring system so that you don't have to go out to customers. And the other issue is, going out, we, there's a lot of talk about geolocation, how you locate, triangulate to, to find the location of sensors. It's not that accurate, and when you go into a room like this, where you might have 200 sensors in our world, hidden in fridges and freezers, hidden under trays, hidden in the bread or the whatever, it's really, really hard to go and find the sensor if you haven't thought through the whole process of labeling and dis how you visualize these sensors online, because it's no good saying it's in that lab. You have to know, and, and it might say, we have some really bizarre names for some of the fridges and freezers that we, we, we monitor. And, and, if, and to try and find that by actually going and reading names is too hard. You have to be able to know exactly where that sensor is. So we put a lot of work into the back end as well. It's cost us a lot of money. We've had investment, we've put money in ourselves, but we've also been lucky because through our innovation, we've won some uh, really valuable um, innovation grants, technology and innovation grants from the EU um, and from the UK government. So the platform, the platform is, you know, sensors, gateway, network server, all that kind of stuff. It's mobile friendly, and I, I shouldn't actually even say mobile friendly, as in it works on a mobile. People will say their products are mobile friendly, but actually working, truly working on a mobile, so that when you're going around doing installations, you're not having to carry around a laptop or an iPad. You can just pull your phone out, you can do the whole installation from your phone. You can access everything about the system on your phone. Everything that you can do from a larger device, you can do on your phone. It's one thing getting alarms, but it's getting alarms that you want, not the alarms you don't want. So you need some, um, obviously, you need all the uh, conditions that you can easily set within the system to make sure that you don't get woken up in the middle of the night unnecessarily. Of course, if 65 uh, years of research is about to go down the pan because your freezer, your, your biomedical freezer's failed, you do want to be woken up, but only under those conditions. You also want to make sure that you're sharing the alarms. A whole load of people might get alarms. How do you know you're not all running after the same problem? So you need to be able to manage a community of people getting an alarm so that, that you don't have wasted resource trying to fix the same problem. We've obviously got all the charts, reporting, different visualizations. It's important, as I said, about being able to have pictures of a room so you can instantly see where sensors are. You might be we, we monitor on the move. We've got to have maps showing real-time movement of, of goods as they're, as they're moving across the country. We also want customers to be able to prove to their customers that they're taking quality seriously. So we've allowed customizable screens to allow them to, in a really um, interesting way, display to their customers that they are doing monitoring behind the scenes to make sure that they're kept safe. We've increased our sensor types. So we were, we started off in refrigeration. Um, we've extended our temperature range from minus 200 in cryogenic temperature monitoring up to plus 300. We do uh, temperature, um, we do obviously any vent trigger stuff like door contacts. We've created pressure sensors in partnership with people um, and so on and so on. Some of these sensors we've built ourselves. Some of these sensors we, we uh, an awful lot of our sensors we, we, we take people who are clever at what they do, and then we incorporate it into our world. So it's not about, and it's something I want to come on to later, not, there's, you see here so much great stuff going on, and everyone's a small company. Not all, a lawful lot of them are a small company. You know, 50% of companies in this business, in this industry are less than three years old. And we're not all going to survive if we just, it's like, don't look at my work, this is my work, and I don't want to let, let anyone in. So it's all about collaboration to be able to then create, um, have your area of expertise that you're really good at, and then for a customer, for your own customers, build around other things through collaborating with other companies. Have we achieved our goals? I think we have, I hope we have. We've got customers that say, oh, amazing service. Um, we've got customers who are um, getting value from the system from the single 
um, single fridged pharmacy who wouldn't, wouldn't be without it. One sensor, one gateway, he can afford it. Up to the um, laboratories where, as I said, they have like 150 sensors in a room smaller than this, in various locations across various countries, across various continents. We have the butcher that thinks it's great, who said the return on investment was a month and a half for him, through to Lufthansa, who after a nine-month evaluation chose us for their Sky Chefs organization where they have 365 um, operations around the world and they're rolling us out. So we have a whole range of customers across a whole range of in industries. We monitor on the move um, and we monitor across industry, industry sectors. So what next? So, we want to do more sensors, we want to do more countries, we want to do more sectors, and we want to add more functionality. We're rolling out soon in China and Australia and Canada. Um, but as I said before, I really just want to stress, we want to work with people to share what we do, um, have a openness, a open APIs, um, people can, use, can send their data to our platform, we can use their sensors, and so on. For us, for the future, some of the other things we're doing, we do heat mapping for, 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 for um, Donata, who are a large logistics company worldwide. We do heat mapping using our sensors. We want to make that easier for them. We want it, them to, to be able to see their data instantly, um, however they want to do it. So we're doing a lot of work on visualization and allowing people to, um, to heat map um, their, them without actually having to have teams of people analyzing the data. And through our innovation grants and some of the expertise we've got, we're looking at energy consumption, energy optimization. It's fine to say it's too cold, turn your temperature up a bit and you'll save lots of money. It's fine to say, hmm, it's maybe not work performing as well, maybe there's a block condenser, but we want to make it more than that. We want to be able to say to people, this is how much energy you're spending on this fridge. This is how much energy you're spending compared to the same fridge in your organization, or how much energy you're, spend, you're spending compared to the benchmark of a really good fridge or freezer of a similar type and cubic capacity in, um, uh, com uh, compared to... Uh, the, sorry, the relative performance against a, a benchmark. So, we've got lots to do. Um, we enjoy what we do, it has been stressful, but we think we've got a cool company. Um, and we've enjoyed, really enjoyed being here and meeting some great people that we hope that we're gonna build relationships with going forward. Um, and have you got any questions? I, I'm afraid I didn't finish at 18. <laughs> so, a 25 second applause, please, for Ali Miller. <laughs> They're never gonna hold that 25. Okay, I, I think that's enough. That was an inspiring talk. We don't have time for questions, but I, I think you delivered on a, on a cool talk. From an inspiring be, a beginning goal, then you make your, your cryogenic goals and your high. What are your goals for the, for, the, for the next five or 10 years? Well, we'd obviously like to, um, we could, we're, we're focusing on growth. Our, 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 we're focusing on growth from a company point of view. Mm -hmm. We've invested a huge amount in building what we've got. And you can continue broadening and broadening and broadening, which we plan to, but I say we want to do that a lot with collaboration. We want to, you, you, we want to focus on, on, on big growth, continued growth. Yeah. Which is a great message for us all. Ladies and gentlemen, Ali Miller.